garden because uh, it's, you know, it's good for the plants. Where do you see the direction of the American diet going? I mean, you've talked about a lot of these negative aspects. Is there any positive change that's happening right oh, now? Yeah. And do you There's... think that we can ultimately revolutionize the American diet? Yeah, um, reform it. Revolutionize, we'll see. Um, there are a lot of very positive things happening in this country around food. There is an awareness uh, that didn't exist five years ago uh, about what we're eating and the impact it's having on our health. There is a feedback loop going on, and type 2 diabetes is a big part of it. The number of families that are having meetings with their pediatrician, where their pediatrician is saying, look, this is the path your child is on. They have metabolic syndrome or they're pre-diabetic, and they can either change their diet now or they're going to be on drugs for the rest of their lives and, you know, 80 percent chance of heart disease, seven years off their lifespan, all these, you know, it's a, just a terrible sentence and it's preventable. And so, you know, I, I see a kind of feedback loop happening that, that people are understanding the impact of a fast food diet in a way they didn't. Um, you see the growth of farmers markets, which has been stunning. I mean, it's it's doubled twice in 10 years. Um, we don't know how much money is spent at farmers markets, but it's it's big right now. I mean, it's not being reported to the government. I think is why we don't know. Um, it, it's a kind of hidden food economy. It's sort of what was happening in the Soviet Union at the end. You know, half the food in the Soviet Union was coming through unofficial uh, channels at the end um, because people didn't trust the mainstream food system and it wasn't providing enough. And um, we are building our own. Um, uh, you know, Samus dot food system in this country right now. And, and then you have the, you know, the, the more mainstream aspects. Organic is still, even in this recession, is still growing. People are looking for alternatives. Um, people are gardening in much greater numbers than they ever have before in this country, largely due to Michelle Obama's influence, I think. Although it had started before that. Um, you know, try to order seeds this year. You know, they're in short supply. Um, so I think that we are, you know, I wouldn't say we've reached a point where we've turned the corner and we know the battle is won by any means, and the industry is doing everything it, it can to co-opt this movement. I mean, they're selling Frito-Lay potato chips as local in Maine and Idaho now, okay? Because because every food is local somewhere. Your recommendation to Congress on the Child Nutrition Act? Money. I mean, it needs a few things, but it needs money. It needs a significant increase in funding. Um, it needs um, it, they need to follow these Institute of Medicine standards that have been created. They've finally gotten the writing of the nutritional standards out of the government with an independent body that has come up with much stronger standards. If they apply those, that will get a lot of junk food out of the system. I mean, right now we're feeding you know way too much fat. We have minimums of calories in the school lunch, not maximums. We need maximums too, because um, you know good school lunch staff get dinged for inadequate calories. And the easiest way to get a lot of calories in that lunch is serve them tater tots, fried potatoes. And, and they do it, just to fulfill this. So change the standards, fund it more uh, adequately. And long term, I think a very important thing to do is make it free to everybody. Right now, it's only subsidized for the poor. And what that means is you have a two-class system in, the, in every lunchroom in America. The kids know who's getting the subsidized lunch and who's not. And there's a huge stigma attached to it. Um, you know, what, what kind of message is that to send? Our most democratic institution, the public schools, break into two classes at lunchtime every day. How do you uh, afford it? You, you determine it's important. I mean, there's what is more important than the health of our children? And, um, you know, you will save on health care. Um, and this is another issue where the health insurance industry and the government, which is now going to be on the hook for a lot more of our health care bill, will now have an interest in the health of our children in a way they haven't. And spending, you know, another $40 billion on school lunch will suddenly look like a deal. What about uh, Rule 58, do all your eating at a table, and 59, try not to eat alone? Well, we're doing a lot of eating on the run. We're eating in the car, something like a fifth of, of food uh, eaten by people, young people, is eaten in the car right now. The cup holders, you've seen what's happened to the cup holders, they're huge. And they're designing food. There's, Campbell's makes a soup designed to be microwaved and eaten in the car. Um, so eating at tables is a very civilizing act, and, um, and, and you eat more mindfully at a table. I mean, if you're, I mean, you know, you sit in front of the television and you kind of mindlessly go from bowl to mouth. And I, I know, because I can, when my, my son was young and he wouldn't eat any vegetables, I would put a pile of, like, peas or green beans in front of him while he was watching television, and he would eat them without even knowing he'd done it. So, um, so it can be put to good use. Um, 
But basically, restoring food to its social dimension, I think, is really, really important. Um, when we eat alone, we tend to eat more. Um, eating at a table, you eat a little more slowly because there's, you're talking and you're putting down your fork to engage in conversation. And you, re you realize at the table that food is not just fuel. It's communion, too. And those, you know, those meanings of food, I mean, they're important, not just in terms of appetite, but... but you know, eating together, eating home cooked meals is really, really important to um, to our to our, our our families, to our societies, and I think to our political culture. And there's a lot of political skills that are learned at the dinner table. And kids eating alone, or, or families eating in front of the television set, they're not learning. The, you know, this is one of the the, the, the seedbeds of civil society is, is table manners. You learn generosity, you learn sharing, you learn manners. And um, there's a story told when. Um, Newt Gingrich brought in the class of 94. He said to them, all these, you know, young firebrands uh, coming into Congress, he said, don't live in Washington. Just keep your home, keep your family out in, in uh, wherever your districts are to stay in touch with your voters. And a social dimension was lost in Congress of families, you know, finding themselves together. They would eat together. There were picnics. There were apparently all sorts of eating occasions. And this happened during this health care bill, too. There's a little article in the paper saying that the Senate dining room where the parties came together was empty. People were so pissed off at one another. They weren't eating together. You get people to eat together, and a lot of things happen. And finally, cook. Yeah, cook. Very important. Um, very hard, too, for a lot of people. Look, if you want to take back control of your diet from this nutritional industrial complex, from the corporations who want to cook for, cook for you and don't cook very well because they use cheap raw ingredients, too much salt, sugar, and fat to cover that up. You're going to have to cook yourself. I mean, food you cook yourself is healthier food. People who cook eat healthier diets. We know this. Um, so the challenge is finding the time in the day um, to do it. And, and that means we have to make cooking a, uh, a shared responsibility in the home. I mean, one of the reasons that the feminist movement turned against home cooking to an extent during the 70s or 80s is it was women's work, and they were stuck with it. And mo for most of history, that's been the case. Um, so the challenge is to rebuild a non-sexist culture of cooking and share it, either by the day or, you know, parts of, in my house, you know, we take turns. Someone's going to do the main and someone's going to do the side dishes every night. But in some houses, you know, the husband cooks, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and the woman cooks, you know, the wife cooks Tuesday and Thursday. There are ways to do it, and it's really important we figure out how to do this. Um, more men are cooking now than were. The, the percentage is up, uh, which is encouraging. Younger women are not tolerating being in households with men who don't cook at all. Um, and so there's some encouraging. Um, but the trend is, is away from cooking in general. And when we don't cook, we are victims of this food complex, um, you know, because they're not going to cook very well. And it's another rule in the book is, you know, um, don't eat food that um, only eat food that's been cooked by human beings. <laughs> very, very important. Well, Michael Pollan, thank you very much for spending this time with well, us. Well, thank you both very much. Michael Pollan is the author of Food Rules and Eater's Manifesto. Um, he is a professor of journalism at the University of California, Berkeley. His earlier books, In Defense of Food and Eater's Manifesto, and The Omnivore's Dilemma, The Secrets Behind What You Eat. And that does it for our broadcast. If you like a copy of today's show, you can go to our website at democracynow.org. Also, the transcript is there, the video and audio podcast. You can go there also and follow us on Twitter. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Sharif Adokadu, Saren Mate, Anjali Comet, Steve Martinez, Nicole Salazar, Hani Masood, Robbie Karen, Mike DeFilippo, Peter Curries, Miguel Nagara, our engineer. Special thanks to Becca Staley, Julie Crosby, Karen Renucci, Nick Gela, Hugh Grant. Happy birthday, Hugh. Samantha Chambly, Jessel Noor. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.